Hi, welcome to Health Beat. My name is Dr. Chris Bennett with Orion Family Spinal Center, and I'm joined here today with my co-host, Dr. Kenneth Cushman from Shiawassee Spinal Center. Uh, Dr. Cushman, if you could just take a second to tell us a little bit about yourself and, uh, you know, basically how you got introduced into upper cervical care and, and why you do what you do. Okay. Well, um, my story started about 22 years old when I developed some really debilitating back pain and I had gone to a chiropractor and I had had great results. But over the course of about six years, I was starting to get a little bit disgruntled with the notion because I was finding that as long as I would go in and get adjusted fairly regularly, I'd have to go about once a week, it, I would feel great and I wouldn't have any major issues, but if I went longer than that, then all my symptoms would come back. And it was right about that same time that my three-year-old son was having migraine headaches. And we had taken him to medical doctors, chiropractors, pediatric chiropractors who had special training, and nobody could help him. So I began to research and I came across upper cervical care. And the closest doctor who did the technique that I was interested in pursuing was about six hours away, uh, Dr. Kessinger, and, and he was in Cape Girardeau, Missouri at the time. So we drove six hours down to where he was at and uh, he did an assessment on my son and long story short, he's 11 now and he doesn't have migraines anymore. Um, and, but while we were there, he was asking me to tell me about my story and I said, I'm good, I get adjusted a lot. And in the regular chiropractic sense, that's usually considered to be a really good thing. And he just looked at me with this look on his face and like, that's not good. And it was the first time I'd ever had a chiropractor. I'd been to, by that point, probably, you know, 25 different chiropractors. And he was just basically appalled at the notion that I was still not any more stable. I couldn't go longer. It didn't sound like I was any healthier from the matter. So he offered to do an assessment on me and um, did a workup and, and uh, found that I had had an undiagnosed specific kind of misalignment on the top two vertebrae at the base of my skull. And he performed an adjustment. And as the weeks began to go beyond, I started to realize that not only did my migraines and my low back pain go away and start to stay away, but I started to get victory over some digestive issues that had plagued me, um, some lung and respiratory issues, and some ear infection issues that I was still dealing with as an adult. So then I went to him and I said, okay, well, how do I learn how to do this? You know, and he said, it's real easy. You just dedicate the rest of your life and you never get to quit learning. So I was crazy enough that I said, all right, sign me up. And probably about 10 years later, um, I run one of the busiest clinics in my community and see patients not just for pain, but for visceral conditions and for pretty much any condition you can imagine. Awesome. Well, upper cervical care, for those of you who are joining us for the first time today, Upper cervical, upper cervical care is a specialized form of chiropractic where we focus on the top two bones in the neck. And the reason we do that is because those bones are intimately related to the brainstem. And as we know, scientifically, the brainstem controls every single function in the body. So in order for your heart to beat, for your lungs to breathe, for your body to fight illnesses the way it should, that brainstem needs to be able to communicate with the body at 100% without any interruption. And so upper cervical care is designed to look at the function of that brainstem, make sure it's functioning correctly. And if it's not functioning correctly, usually it's due to a misalignment uh, of one of the top two vertebrae causing that interference. And so we're especially trained to locate that interference and then remove it and then monitor it from that point to make sure that the brainstem functions properly and the person's able to maintain health. So at this time, we're gonna go ahead and take a break. Um, and we're gonna go into our next segment when we come back from the commercial break. And today's topic is going to be on multiple sclerosis. So we're going to dive into what MS is and a little bit about, you know, some possible causes of MS. So for now, we'll be right back. And thank you for joining us on Health Beat. Hey, this is Mickey York from Fox Sports Detroit. When I want to get the inside scoop on local sports, I watch between Terminus or Fox Sports Detroit.
Hi, welcome back to Health Beat. I'm Dr. Chris Bennett with Orion Family Spinal Center, and I'm joined here with my co-host, Dr. Kenneth Cushman from Shiawassee Spinal Center. Uh, this section, we're going to talk about multiple sclerosis and, and what it is and uh, some possible causes of it. There's a lot of theories out there about the disease. So what MS is, is basically it's a neurological condition in which uh, the patient usually presents with a lot of different um, symptoms such as uh, maybe some you know, weird feelings in different parts of the body, some aches and pains in different parts of the body, a lot of different neurological presentations of the, of the disease. Um, in an article written by um, a guy named Dr. Zamboni, he basically said that what he found was that um, MS, uh, most of the MS patients that he was studying, it was caused by what they call CVSI, which is cerebral vascular insufficiency. Uh, may, basically meaning that the blood going into the brain was insufficient and there was improper blood flow going into the brain. So what MS does is it actually attacks a, a certain part of the nerve called the myelin sheath. Now the myelin sheath is basically, if you think about it, electrical, electrical wires and you put uh, the, the black coating around electrical wires to kind of keep them from touching other electrical wires. Well your nervous system has a lot of the same types of things. So we have that myelin sheath that basically covers the nerve and protects it and keeps it from cross-firing with other nerves. Well, in the disease process of MS, that myelin sheath actually starts to be deteriorated and starts to be eaten away. And what Dr. Zamboni was finding was that the, the improper blood flow into the brain was actually causing some of that demyelination and causing a lot of the presentation of um, MS. So I know, Dr. Cushman, you've had some MS patients in your office uh, and I, I wanted to discuss one last thing because I wanted to ask you about it before we got into it. Um, another study done by Dr. Aaron Elster found that most of her MS patients um, had some type of cervical spine injury that, that predicated or was happening before the MS symptoms occurred. Um, what has been your experience with that? Because I know you have several MS patients of your own. Yeah, it's one of the conditions that I see more prevalently than others, and that's, it sounds like new news, but it really isn't. There's been numerous studies over the years that have suggested a link between cervical spine trauma and a variety of degenerative conditions, MS being one of them, uh, Parkinson's disease, fibromyalgia, and basically they just seem to come back in the research to this link between neck trauma and these other conditions. And when you look at this, the neurologic significance of the brainstem, it begins to make a lot more sense. So we do see a high correlation of people who have those uh, really advanced degenerative type conditions who will state that, yeah, you know, five years previous to the onset of the symptoms, I was rear-ended very badly or something to that effect. And we've seen that in many cervical, upper cervical offices. And uh, there's been numerous studies on that showing that, um, you know, how the, the misalignment or the cervical spine injury actually does happen prior to the onset of symptoms for MS. Yeah, we do definitely see a large link between uh, cervical spine trauma and different debilitating conditions, MS being one of the more prevalent ones. And that's been mentioned in the literature multiple times. Um, so, and I wanted to touch on one of the things that you had spoke to, you had spoke to the blood flow. There's basically two different theories, you know, they don't know exactly what takes place with the process of MS, but the two theories that have been proven to some degree by research is the cerebral flow of the actual blood flow and pressures and how that affects different things within the cranium. And then the other one that will manifest in the newer research is the flow of cerebral spinal fluid. And there's a couple different theories on that. So the one theory suggests that, uh, and we'll keep it as simple as possible, but the one theory suggests that there are blood flow insufficiencies that cause nerves to not function properly, and that then contributes to a degenerative kind of a thing to develop. Um, the, the newer research is kind of linking that together with a situation where the misalignments in the upper cervical spine specifically are not allowing for proper flow of cerebral spinal fluid. Now the first thing that they came out in 2011 um, with one of the studies that they did at that point was that that increased pressure was causing areas where leakage was occurring and that leakage from the excess pressure was thereby damaging the nerves, causing the lesions is what the study said. Gotcha. 
Now, on the newer studies that they're doing, and, and really the, the big jump forward with the way that the research is being done came with the development of upright MRIs. You think about an MRI and a person lays down during a normal MRI, and that allows for the brain tissue to kind of settle into the bowl of the skull. Mm -hmm. And you think about what somebody does when they're not feeling well, they lay down. So they had this theory that if they did upright MRIs, they would be able to get a truer picture of like how much compression has taken place. And they used a variety of methods, including radioactive dyes and things of that sort, to check the flow of the cerebral spinal fluid. And what they found is in these patients who have the upper cervical misalignments, there seems to be a correlation to where that doesn't allow for the CSF to flow properly, which goes and bays the brain and then it goes down into the spinal cord and it just flows just like your blood flow does, but it stays within that central nervous system. Now, couple that with research out of the last couple years that tells us that lymphatic, that the CSF is the lymphatic drainage of the brain, which for those of you who don't know, the lymphatic system doesn't get much play, but it's basically the cleanup crew. It's the drainage system that allows for impurities and toxins to get out of the body. So now they're suggesting a link that the CSF flow is actually a lymphatic method, and that's, that's just come out with research within uh, recent history. So by not allowing that fluid to flow properly, not only are we having the blood implications, but we're also having implications where the brain tissue can't get rid of waste products. And they're speculating that after that takes place for a period of time, the toxicity that develops in those specific areas where the flow is restricted will then cause damage to the nerves. So they did tons of patients and then they went through and they analyzed for the CSF flow and then they made upper cervical corrections to those who actually had demonstrable measurable upper cervical misalignments and they went back and they remeasured these things and they found out that the flow of these different fluids became much more normal and much more regular and some of the newest research that hasn't even come out yet that you spoke to a case in Italy where they're doing some groundbreaking research there. Well, there's some, uh, there's some group of doctors in the States that are doing some of that research as well. And they're actually seeing in some patients that there's a tendency towards some of the smaller lesions actually healing over time. So it's groundbreaking and we're right on the cusp of it. It's very exciting. And it makes sense in hindsight when the research comes out of how could an, a neck trauma, a cervical spine trauma, then contribute to these different debilitating conditions. Right. And so one of the things that, you know, I want to kind of cover here because, especially if you watch like previous episodes, you know, we did an episode on heart disease. Uh, this episode's on multiple sclerosis. We'll do all the episodes on diabetes and a lot of different conditions. But upper cervical care is not a treatment for these conditions. So basically all we do with, as an upper cervical doctor, an upper cervical practitioner, is we just look at that top of the neck and we're just looking at the function of that brainstem. Now when we correct the function of the brainstem and allow actually, you know, remove the interference that those bones are producing there uh, and allow it to communicate properly, then we start to see the body function correctly because our bodies are really designed to heal themselves. They really are. I mean, it's, we know that if you cut your finger, it's not the Band-Aid that heals, it's not the Neosporin that heals. The body actually does it itself. Well, it can heal internally just as it can externally, but it's just gotta be given the right environment to do so. And so this isn't a treatment for MS, it's not a treatment for diabetes, it's not a treatment for heart disease, it's a treatment for malfunction in the body. And we're getting the body to actually function correctly. And when we do, the body can heal from a lot of different conditions. So I just want to make sure that people out there realize that this isn't a treatment for MS. It's not a treatment for any one condition. So uh, Dr. Cushman, I want to thank you for that information. That was a lot of great information. And, and MS is very complicated in a lot of ways as far as uh, the, you know, what they feel is the cause of it. So when we get back, we're going to actually cover some articles that are in the news now. Um, and one of them is the research article that you just mentioned uh, that's being done in, in Italy that hasn't been published yet, but it will be very soon. Uh, and we're also going to be covering a couple other articles that talk about upper cervical treatment of multiple sclerosis. Even though, again, I uh, want to caution that it's not a treatment for MS, but that's the way the article is written. So uh, when we come back, we'll cover our section called What's in the News? And uh, thank you for joining us here on Health Beat. We'll be right back. We want a habitat home. I love working on my habitat home. 
Soy dueño de una casa de habitat. My neighbor is a habitat homeowner. Being a habitat homeowner has changed our lives. My mortgage payment for habitat is less than what I paid for rent. Habitat for Humanity of Oakland County currently has homes available with mortgage payments lower than most rent payments. If you or someone you know needs decent and affordable housing, call 248-338-1843 or visit our website at habitatoakland.org. Hello, I'm Mike Bouchard, the Oakland County Sheriff. There's a big problem that faces all the communities in America today, and that's abuse of legitimate prescription drugs. Sometimes they're left in the home when a loved one passes away, or they're in the medicine cabinet for someone else, and a youngster in the home steals it and they abuse it. It's one of the fastest growing drug abuses that we see in our community and across the country. Secondly, we see these drugs oftentimes when they're no longer utilized being flushed down the drain and we're seeing higher levels of residual pharmaceuticals in our waterways and our streams. So to solve two problems with one effort, we partnered with Home Instead Senior Care to start a program called Operation Medicine Cabinet to get those drugs out of the homes, out of the hands of youngsters and out of the waterway and safely and environmentally destroy them. Learn more about the program at OperationMedicineCabinetMI.com and be part of the solution. Thank you. Hi, welcome back to Health Beat. I'm Dr. Chris Bennett, and I'm joined with my co-host, Dr. Ken Cushman. Uh, we are going to talk about our section now called What's in the News? And uh, this, this episode has been on MS, so this uh, first uh, case study that we're going to talk about is an older case study by, done by Dr. Aaron Elster, who is an upper cervical practitioner. And um, basically what this case study entails is that it was a 44-year-old woman that presented to her office with, uh, had, that had been diagnosed with MS. Um, her MRIs had showed lesions on the brain. And um, what they found was after one year of upper cervical care, uh, this patient had a follow-up MRI uh, and what they found with the follow-up MRI is that there were no new lesions and the original lesions that were on the original MRI were weakened and less intense. Uh, now this patient, can, and, the, and the symptoms actually at that time, I, I should mention this also, the actual outward symptoms, the clinical symptoms of MS were absent completely. Um, and then after two years of, chiro of upper cervical chiropractic care, what they found was that the, uh, the two-year follow-up on MRI showed again no new lesions, completely absent symptoms, and the original lesions uh, were even less intense yet still from the first MRI they did at the one year follow-up. And uh, what the neurologist concluded was that the upper cervical chiropractic care that this patient received actually triggered a reversal in the progression of MS, allowing the patient to be symptom free. And so uh, there's another study that's about to come out um, I'm hoping within the next year, uh, that was done out of Italy. And that study actually talks about MS and what they studied in that, it was done by several medical doctors in Italy. And they actually looked at blood flow going into the brain. And they determined that um, patients that had MS had abnormal blood flow that was going into the brain that was actually leading to the demyelination of the neurons or, or of the nerves, if you wanna use the word nerves, uh, and causing the symptoms of MS. Now, why that's important and why that means anything is because earlier we discussed that um, another study done by Dr. Aaron Elster found that most of her MS patients had some type of previous cervical spine injury. So how do we go from cervical spine injury over here to symptoms of MS? And basically what happens is, is as a cervical spine injury happens, it actually knocks out of alignment one of those top two bones. Now the top two bones actually do not literally put, they don't literally hit the brainstem or put pressure on the brainstem, but what happens is the covering that surrounds the brainstem and spinal cord, which is called the dural sac, is actually intimately uh, attached to the brainstem up in the upper cervical region. And as those bones actually move out of alignment, the way they move out of alignment, they actually cause that dural sac to twist and actually cause an irritation and reduction in fluid flow and blood flow in that area. So as this area is correctly and specifically realigned, it allows that area to actually get the proper flow up to the brain and proper blood flow is restored. Therefore, in this study in, in Italy, what they were finding was that the patients were actually 
uh, having relief of symptoms of MS. And this was a very big study that was done. Now, I know, Dr. Cushman, we talked earlier, and you were telling me before the show that you had a patient that had some very different MS symptoms or for some very severe MS symptoms. Mm -hmm. If you want to discuss that case with us just briefly. Yeah, with, with MS, the tricky part about it is you can have any variety of symptoms. It's just basically nerves quit working properly. So in this particular woman's case, some of her biggest symptoms was migraine headaches. Um, she had a lot of problems where she would be feeling fine and she'd be carrying her grandchild. And she'd gotten to the point where she couldn't carry her grandchild because there was a couple times where her leg just quit working and she fell down. So just intermittent loss of function of limbs that would come back. But one of the strangest ones that I thought was very unique in her case is she'd have periods of time where her eyes would go crossed. And she, she was a customer service representative and she was on a computer and her eyes would just go cross and they'd stay that way for sometimes two days at a stretch. Which is difficult for someone to do. Well, yeah, and just imagine, just imagine like when you don't know what's happening. So she had been to the doctor and they had ultimately through the long process diagnosed her with multiple sclerosis. And she was under treatment, but she wasn't having any relief from her symptoms. So she came over and at this point it had developed into dizziness and lots of other things as well and asked if we could help. I said, obviously, I don't know until I have a chance to do an evaluation. Now, one thing that people need to know is that an upper cervical chiropractor has a lot more training than what a regular chiropractor or a full spine chiropractor undergoes. Um, we basically go through that process and then we go on to postgraduate studies with a legitimate upper cervical group that does training on more tools and more analysis and more ways to discover exactly what's going on in that area. So I applied the analysis and she had a, a very big misalignment of the top bone in her neck, the C1 bone. And still I did not know if I was gonna be able to help her. So we provided a test correction. We came back and remeasured with all the methods that we used to find the misalignment. And it tested that the, the misalignment was corrected for. And over the course of the next two to three months, one by one, her symptoms began to lessen to the point where basically they all went away. And she, still gets checked periodically and hasn't had any relapses or any negative downturns. And she attributes the upper cervical care to the fact that her symptoms, she can't really tie it together to anything else, like why are they doing so good? Especially the migraines, which she had for years prior to the diagnosis of MS. So what I thought was interesting about her case was not necessarily all that. That's very, very, very nice to hear. But what was really interesting was the fact of, out of all that and after everything that she had suffered, she came back to, she had written a testimonial and provided that to the office about you know her experience. And the biggest thing she was satisfied about is she could pick up her grandchild again. Yeah. So when we talk about these topics, it's easy to make them too science-laden and, and, and too research-based. You gotta have that aspect of it. But what we're really talking about here is we're talking about people's lives and we're talking about their ability to live their lives normally and to love on, I mean, imagine never being able to pick up a child or a grandchild, how out of fear that you would hurt them. So she's very pleased and I'm very pleased. And uh, I, just, I just keep getting more and more of these types of cases and they're hard cases to work through. You can't leave a single stone unturned, but if you do the time and you work it right, you have a lot of potential consistently to see pretty amazing things happen. So it was interesting to see that. Yeah, one thing I also found too is that um, upper cervical management of like an MS patient, um, it's really important that we're conservative with their care um, for the simple fact that their nervous system is already very sensitive. Um, this is a type of case where you want to adjust as least as possible. And so when you do have to make that adjustment, you want to make sure that, man, it's dead on. Right. Because uh, you're only going to get a chance a few times, you know, to when it needs to be corrected to make the right correction. And so, yeah, it's really important that we maintain that patient very conservatively and, and, and care for them very conservatively because their nervous system is very, very sensitive. And, you know, tying together with what you had talked about before in the previous segment about how it's not really a treatment for MS. That's a real important point. The way that I'll describe it to my patients is, it's not like I, you know, if somebody comes in and they've got an inflamed L5 disc and it's producing sciatica into their low back, I'm not gonna do anything different for that person than what I'm gonna do for the person who has a diagnosis of MS. Right. I'm gonna apply the analysis, 
find where the issues are at, and then remove those issues. And the reason why people don't know that their body is capable of healing is most of the time, as you've probably experienced, you do a workup on somebody, and when you date the x-rays and the trauma, this is a 25-year-old trauma yeah. that's only showed up in these symptoms within the last couple of years. So as we go in and we remove the barriers, then the body begins to heal, and it's that healing process that enables that person to get well. It's not us treating their MS or treating their low back pain or treating their irritable bowel syndrome. It's a matter of getting the irritation off of the nerves so that they can do their job properly. And consistently you see high, high levels of people. The, my, my clinic is built upon a specific type of patient. Patients who've been everywhere, patients who've tried everything, chiropractors, neurologists, and they're hopeless. So it's a very, it's very hard work, but it's very encouraging when they start to feel those changes take place in their body. It's one thing to talk about it, it's another thing to feel it. Yeah. But when they start to feel those changes take place in their body and they get hope for the first time in years, that's my joy in practice. Yeah, same here. Yeah, there's no greater joy than, like you said, to, to have someone who doesn't have that hope anymore because they've been to every doctor under the sun and no one's done anything to help them. Same thing, I have a patient, I have several patients like that, that basically they were told this is a permanent condition and you're not gonna get any better from it and they've gotten well. And it's not because I'm an amazing doctor, it's because we just unlock the healing potential of the body. So I wanna thank you, Dr. Cushman, for joining us today. It was my pleasure and my joy. Thank you, Dr. Bennett. If you have any uh, questions or comments or a topic you'd like for us to cover, um, or if you just wanna locate an upper cervical doctor near you, please shoot us an email at Orion Family Spinal Center at gmail.com and we'll answer those emails as they come in. Uh, thank you and we will see you next time on Health Beat.